Welcome to Epicenter, the podcast where we interview crypto founders, builders, and thought leaders. I'm Sebastien Couture. Uh, today I'm speaking with Jérôme de Tichet, who is the founder of Cometh and also uh, the founder of ETCC. I'm sure if you've heard him on the podcast before in that context. And today we're going to be speaking mostly about Cometh. And just full disclosure, I'm an investor uh, in this project. Uh, but before we speak to Jerome about Cometh, I'd like to tell you about our sponsor this week. DEXs are great, but they're vulnerable to problems like MEV, failed transactions, and high gas costs. CowSwap tackles these issues head-on and offers a new type of trading experiment. It's built by Gnosis. CowSwap is a meta-DEX aggregator. That's right, it's a DEX aggregator aggregator. And it fights MEV by matching overlapping orders directly. So if no coincidence of wants, that's where the cow comes from, is found, then trades are settled on a variety of underlying on-chain AMMs, depending on which pool offers the best price. So give CowSwap a try and enjoy perks like no gas fees, paid on-field transactions, optimized transaction management for multi-sig and DAOs, as well as some other fun and entertaining surprises. Head over to cowswap.exchange and start swapping today. Jerome, thanks for joining me uh, today. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm sad I had to give you a, a, an investment cheap to get on the podcast, <laughs> <laughs> but that's definitely worth it. <laughs> yeah, no, but you know, it's, it's funny because I was thinking about this before and I, I first uh, found out about Cometh um, because our mutual friend, uh, Simon, de, uh, Simon Polro was, uh, you know, came into the office one day when, you know, when I was working at Adan and, and uh, he was, I was like, I saw him like doing something kind of weird on his screen with this, like these ships and stuff. And I was like, Simon, what are you doing? He's like, oh man, I'm staking my must tokens and I'm getting dust. And I'm like, you know, make, building these <laughs> ships and everything. And I said, like, okay, that's, that's, that's too much for me. Like, and I just went back to work and, then, um, <laughs> you know, as, uh, as time went on, I, I started like learning more about the project and, um, and yeah, finally like ended up uh, investing in the project. Um, but yeah, I think this is, you know, really a, a cool project because it, 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 int it introduces people to DeFi without actually like knowing, like people could play the game and like not know that they're interacting with all these DeFi primitives. And I think that's what's really powerful. Um, so, you know, our listeners probably know you as the guy who organizes ETCC and, you know, we had you on the, on the show a couple of times when we went to the conference, but, um, yeah. you know, tell me, tell us a bit about yourself. Like who is Jérôme de Tichet and how did you become involved with the Ethereum community? And, you know, I think what a lot of people don't realize is like you had a really important role in the early days of the French Ethereum community. So tell us a bit about your journey. Okay. 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 And this, this journey has been, um, an amazing one, like most of the people that has been a little early in this, in the space, but it's been, it's been great also because we had our resources like Epicenter. So it was like when we preparing this, we were preparing this, uh, this interview. I told you like one of my childhood dream, like a blockchain childhood dream was to, to be one day on the, on Epicenter because like I, I, I learned a lot, uh, watching some podcasts. I remember Vlad Zamfir's early podcasts, uh, and, and, and also was like, uh, like Rick Dudley and, uh, and so on, or even Vitalik on the podcast. It really convinced me to, to get even deeper on Ethereum and, and learned a lot from this podcast. So I, I used to, I used to try to do research in economics. I started a PhD, uh, uh, back in, uh, 2011. Um, and then I couldn't find uh, the proper financing. Um, I couldn't find the proper subject. Uh, I was struggling and, and decided to, uh, to, to be an economist in, in private institution, in public institutions. Uh, back in those days, I learned about Bitcoin. Um, the, the very idea of doing, uh, money without central bank was very appealing. Uh, I found it super interesting. And looking back, uh, I'm, I was, uh, teaching courses in economics, um, at different university and, and I'm, now also a, a professor in economics at uh, an engineering school. Uh, when I when I realized what Bitcoin could be or what what crypto asset could be, um, I also realized what the, the, the lack of understanding uh, of money uh, even in, in in economics courses. So it it was my rabbit hole. I wanted to to get uh, to get deeper into it. I wanted to understand it better. I wanted to to participate to whatever movement was going on at this stage. And um, I soon decided to do some mining. 
did did bad investment in binding because I, I bought GPUs when the the network was switching to FPGA uh, and then to ASIC. So every time there was a a, a change in the technology, uh, I was less and less effective in my in my mining return. Um, and I discovered Ethereum this way. Like I, I wasn't too connected with the with the the, the crypto communities. I, I I didn't participate to the ICO uh, in 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 the early days, but when the network went online, I just switched my miners there and tried to do something. Uh, this is where I, I got to meet people from the French ecosystem, like uh, Simon that you, you mentioned before. Um, and we were trying to get people together in 2015 about uh, just meetups to discuss Ethereum, just meetups to discuss how to do a smart contract, how to run a, a mining software at scale, how to, how to make sure that those things work. Can we overclock our GPUs? What, what could we do? Um, so this is how the the nonprofit called it used to be called Asset uh, A S S E T H, uh, hence why many people ask this. Well, why would you call anything as if or as at? Like what what is this thing? Uh, we we started off this nonprofit to uh, to get a, a little legal structure around the the meetups that we were organizing and. I, back in those time, I was working for um, the European Commission. Um, on the French side, I was a statistician and economist for uh, um, some of the studies that uh, the Commission was publishing. And while the 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 giant uh, giant leap was uh, going to going to Shanghai from for DEFCON two, um, I got many many a good adventures uh, happened there. I uh, met lots of good people. Um, I think our, our pass, uh, yours and mine, cross maybe uh, a little later or, or uh, in Shanghai. Um, and you know, this is this is where uh, the whole adventure really really started. Like um, I met Joe Lubin. We were uh, fantasizing about opening an office in Europe. Um, I had just uh, had an offer from Ernst and Young to start there. Um, blockchain team. It was 2016. Yeah, like about time. Um, and also the foundation uh, Vitalik and uh, uh, back in those days it was Min Chan. Uh, we were looking at organizing uh, events uh, similar to DevCon in in Paris or in Europe. So they put us in touch, like Ethereum France and uh, and um, and the Ethereum Foundation and and the organizers from EdCon to help them set up uh, EdCon in Paris. And so we did EdCon in Paris in 2017, and we liked it so much. Like organizing an event like this in in Paris was so great that we decided to do the same thing every year. And so far, so good. I'm uh, knocking on wood. Uh, we managed to organize this conference every year ever since. So 2017 for the zero edition, EdCon Paris, and then EdCC one, two, three, four, and five. Um, and on the side, I was following my my own career in the space. So I worked at uh, Ernst & Young for about a year and a half, and then I worked at Consensus for about two years, and then I worked at uh, Ledger for a year and a half, and uh, now I'm uh, I'm I'm my own boss working uh, on Cometh. Um, and having lots of fun. Uh, along the way, uh, Asset changed the name to become Ethereum France. Uh, the website was created by Simon, Simon Porro. Uh, and then we, were, we, we decided to take this brand instead of Asset because well, it's easier for, for, uh, no, for, for speakers to say Ethereum France instead of Asset. And the brand is a bit, uh, a bit stronger. Um, and yeah, we are at the moment preparing to open the, the sponsorship, uh, the call for sponsors and the call for, 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 um, speakers for HCC next year, July, 2022. Um, I'm looking forward to, to seeing all of you guys in, uh, in Paris and also, uh, congrats to, uh, to, to the Liscon guys for hosting a beautiful conference that happened last week and Shout out to Gnosis, we, we were doing such a great job and uh, I've been using CoSwap and, and testing it out in LISCON, it's pretty pretty nice. I I mean, with regards to like ETC, I'm, I, I'm always just so thrilled that like there's such a great conference happening in the city where I live and like that I don't have to travel to go there. It's like, I just go home at night. It's, <laughs> it, it's really great. And I mean, this year was you know, amazing. Um, given, given the context, I think it was like a, a, a huge achievement to be able to like host ETC in, in such a context. I wanted to mention about ETC that uh, we are still doing this conference. Well, we are doing this conference as a nonprofit and try to keep the same uh, same vibe of, uh, yeah, just 
it's it's at cost just come have fun if you don't get a ticket because whatever reason it's sold out uh, just get there and uh, and enjoy the, the side events and so on but from an organizer's perspective we, we are seeing this uh this shift in the in the ecosystem where uh, now people are coming to SEC to do business. They, they know they are going to, to meet people that will be partners, will be, uh, will be potential clients, will be potential, um, uh, colleagues. Um, so it's, uh, it's really nice to see, uh, uh, how our, our ecosystem matured, uh, through the eyes of, uh, of the conference that we organize. And I, I hope that next year we will finally get to, uh, to bring a- Asian projects to, uh, to Paris. Cause that was one of the, one of the things I regret the most uh, over those years. Uh, I think 2019, we were too young and, and, and still too much in the beer market to really get people to travel. 2020, people w- were ready to travel, but got denied traveling. Uh, and 2021, it was too unsure for, for people to travel. So what I want for next year is that uh, we really bring people from all over the world, not only the Western world in Paris, because it feels like so many things are happening uh, in Asia that uh, we are missing out and uh, we could continue accelerating and growing the cake for everyone by uh, getting those, those communities together. There you go. So if you're in Asia and you know, you've got a cool project and you want to pitch Jerome, uh, you know, we'll, we'll put the links in the show notes on where you can do that. Um, so I, I just want to talk briefly about you know, your role at Ledger because you, you recently left Ledger as uh, the, I think it was like global head of customer success or like some cu- customer facing role. Um, yeah. you know, because Ledger is such a pillar, I think in like the French crypto ecosystem and, and like in the global ecosystem, like broadly, like, what did you take away from that experience? Like working there? Um, so the, the full title was global head of client success. So it's, uh, it's like a, uh, like clearly a, a role that's, uh, that's big and small at the same time. I was in charge of both the B2B and the B2C, uh, satisfaction of our clients. So whether you are the holder of um, the, the the owner of, uh, of of a Nano S or Nano X, or whether you are a a, a client for a Ledger custody solution for enterprise Ledger Vault, um, you will at some point have had to to deal with deal with me on uh, the support on uh, what features you wanted, or what uh, what improvement of the of the of the wallet you wanted, the experience. Well. Uh, First off, when you change job in the middle of COVID, it's, um, it's, it's, it's tough to get to manage a team of, uh, 35 or 40 something, uh, 40 ish, uh, number of people. So large team in transition was, uh, was kind of hard to, to manage large team, uh, and in the, in the middle of, in the middle of COVID. So you don't get to really to, to create a human link. So I had to work a lot on this to make sure that the, the team kept this cohesion. Um, and also it was both a, an exciting time for Ledger because they were starting to fundraise, the, the, the bull market was standing off, but also they unfortunately faced some difficulties with the data leak notably or, uh, with, uh, with, um, you know, crypto in general, <laughs> like new, new things happening all the time, new, new requests all the time to, to integrate XYZ. Um, so personally, I, I, I had, um, I had a very good time there. Uh, it was a very demanding role. Um, but I learned a lot being in, uh, in, in touch with, uh, individuals like, uh, like Pascal Gauthier, like Ian Rogers, like, um, uh, Jean-Michel Payon, the guys in charge of the, the B2B division. Um, and I, I got to see what a, what a blockchain team that was trying to tackle the whole blockchain space because Ledger is, uh, Ledger is really not focused on Bitcoin and Ethereum. Uh, they are focused on anything crypto, focused on, on getting people into crypto uh, one way or another. Um, so I, I learned how, it, how hard it could be to, to support all of those networks at once. I learned also to, to, see the, to, to see the constraint through the eyes of uh, very security focused people, but not really from a, from a, a smart contract perspective, but on a, how to keep your key safe. There are certain things that uh, Ledger hasn't, hasn't tried yet. Um, and I, I cannot say if they will go there or, or not uh, at some point, but uh, you know, the, the example of smart contract, uh, what smart contract wallets, like, uh, like Gnosis Safe, for example, is doing is something that is not uh, taboo, but just weird from a, from a purely uh, uh, pure, pure uh, ledger set of mine. Uh, those things are evolving, of course, but 
when I arrived at Ledger, I was like, hey, so cool, guys. Uh, I come from Consensus. We are doing uh, lots of stuff about uh, about smart contract security, like uh, smart contract as secure. Let's go. And they were like, probably probably rightfully so. Well, guys, we focus on uh, making good key generation and making sure that the people know what they are signing. So this kind of uh, this kind of approach was uh, really an, a, an enrichment for me, um, and I'm I'm glad about my, my time there. Um, glad about the transition that I did between Ledger and, and Comet, and they were very supportive. Um, so yeah, I, I advise anyone that uh, uh, find a role uh, on on the job list that uh, that is at Ledger to definitely consider applying. It's a really good brand and really good team. Yeah, I wonder how I mean how Ledger is going to evolve you know, as as crypto becomes more mainstream because you know as, I think for like a lot of people that are coming into this space now like you know there's like been the cycles right so like people that came in in 2016 2017 I think were fairly technically minded and um you know had a good understanding of like how cryptography works for the most part and like the importance of holding keys and stuff I, the people I meet now that are getting into crypto are like just just like all, you know regular people. They're like to total normies, you know. And like I went to a party a couple of weeks ago, and like four or five people were asking me about crypto <laughs> and how they can buy NFTs. And it's like it's a total new class of people. It's not the same as like in 2016. It's like your neighbor, right? And so the the meme the meme of you standing with your with your glass saying like they don't know I'm a, I'm a hash mask owner yeah 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 no it, it, it totally doesn't work totally yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Are like hey you're the NFT guy tell me how you can be into crypto <laughs> so so this I mean it doesn't help that I walk around wearing like t-shirts that say Liberté Égalité <laughs> NFT but um, yeah so and, and I think for these people like the 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 risk um, associated to like holding your own keys and like storing those keys. It's it's too much, and I think that's it's too complex for like this kind of audience. And so you know, not not to like not to to plug you know a, a competitor here, but like I, I uh, I've been working on another podcast called the Zen Crypto Show with um with my friends over at Zengo, and you know we, we're trying to educate people uh, about crypto. And like the experience there is you know there is a, a trade off with regards to like who holds the keys because it's like a multi party thing, like they have a key and you have a key, but. I find that for a beginner, I I mean, that's something where I can go to and say like in five minutes, like you're set up, you're secure, you can you can have crypto, and I wonder where Ledger is going to sit in this evolving ecosystem where they continue to have this um, this uh, this this product that relies on on key generation. You're right. <laughs> it's a it's a it's a tough it's a tough question, and I. I uh, I I don't have a definitive answer to that. Of course, um, I I kind of remember the time where you were into crypto, like in 2014, 15, 16, even 17. People were telling you like, okay, so key generation, use a Trezor or, or a ledger, uh, and also run your own node. You have to run your own node. People were like running your own node. Will it, will it ever come into 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 play now? Who is running their own node? I'm I'm running a node, but. Because doing other things, but like if you're just a user, if you just have a, if you're just buying a wh whatever NFT uh, on OpenSea, you're not running your own node. You're even potentially paying with credit card on OpenSea. So, yeah, I mean, I run my own mail server, and there was <laughs> yeah. a time I think when people ran their own mail servers, but at some point people just started using Gmail. Right. And not to make this a whole right. conversation about you know about like you know this the steering, but but I think it is a a, a, a pressing point that. People are not going to continue using solutions like Ledger if if there is this kind of technical burden and like this responsibility to have keep to keep your keys. Yeah, but right, but when you when you open up a Ledger and you do the setup, um, and over the past two years, the setup in a Ledger has has improved a lot. Uh, like you can always improve the user experience, the user uh, feedback on on what it is to start using the product. Uh, but in any case, it will come down to this hassling. Uh, like, okay, now you need to generate the key. Now you need to write down the 24 words. Look at what MetaMask is doing. You, you, you install MetaMask, you start using MetaMask, and every time you do a transaction, they tell you like, did you do your backup? So you should do your backup. Um, that's, that's a good way to, to just uh, not force the people into, into getting into it. But at, at least the, the, the advantage of, Ledger over the solution is that 
you are doing this as link once in the beginning and you have to do it. So you have to do this little education on key security, key reliability, key responsibility. It's never enough because once it's done and you start trading, you forget about it. And at some point you remember that you give away your 24 words to your best friends, which is now not your best friend anymore. Uh, so it's super tough to find, to find the right spot of this. And, uh, uh, at, at Cometh, for example, we have, uh, we are, we are like at the, at the opposite side of the spectrum. Um, if you were to use our, our game, uh, we would ask you to connect with a wallet. You have one, you don't have one. Never mind. Just put your email and we rely on Magic Link, which is a, a, a wallet provider based on, on emails. So every time you log in, you receive an email saying, you want to log into Cometh? Yes, I want to log into Cometh. And now you are using this key to transact on our smart contract. So we take away the liability from Cometh onto, onto Magic Link. Yes. Uh, but once we see that the player is, uh, accumulating some decent amount of valuable tokens, uh, we try to nudge them onto uh, a better solution, onto using Agnosis Safe, using a ledger, using a thing. And we have this concept of player profiles that is an externally owned account where the Magic Link uh, account is the, the reference for playing. But whenever you want to do something, uh, something weird, something more uh, DeFi oriented, we nudge you into getting something uh, more secure. But you know, it's that's point, a really good approach. Kind of, I, I, yeah. I like that that kind of gradual approach to you know getting to a more secure, you know, a more secure solution. There's no, um, there's no one size fits all, and yeah. um, it's it's going to be uh, our our industry's challenge for uh, the next two or three years until eventually Apple or Samsung try start to put the the wallet in the enclave. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a good chance we're going to get there. Uh, so let, let's, uh, th this has been a long enough intro, but this is really interesting. I, I go on about this stuff. Um, so yeah, let, tell what what is Cometh and, um, you know, what what kind of game is it? What's your goal as a player? Like, what is it, for people who are not familiar maybe with gaming so much, like, what are some other games that they may be familiar with, at least just by name, that kind of re resemble uh, Cometh? Um, so... We had a first, uh, so now under the name Cometh, we, we have different games, um, not only just one, but at the moment two are live and another one is uh, about to be released. Um, so we, we see ourselves as a, as a web tree game studio, blockchain game studio, um, because the, we emit some assets, we emit NFTs, we emit some NRC20 uh, that are used in our games. So we see our games as the um, as an infrastructure where you can use the NFTs that you've purchased from us or the the tokens that you've acquired from playing our games. The the first the very first game that we published was a uh, kind of uh, similar to the the dinosaur you get when you don't have internet. You need to avoid uh, uh, black holes and, and and asteroids coming to you when you're just moving your spaceship. You're talking about like in Chrome when, you, when your yeah. internet's not working and you play with the little dinosaur jumping over Yeah, obstacles. we did a proof of concept of this based on the on the NFT that we minted. And then we we start trying out a, another game that for us was a way to, uh, to, to, to test the limits of what blockchain can do uh, in terms of gaming. Um, so Cometh, the game that was uh, live from uh, February to end of September, after this we put the game on IATUS before uh, deploying a new one, was a real-time strategy game. Uh, so you had to position yourself in the space. And the only way you could position yourself in space was to uh, pay another player to move you. So it's a concept we invented called gravity pudding. Uh, Sebastian, you have a spaceship. I have a spaceship. I want to get closer to you. I'm paying you to drag me towards you. Uh, and why would you pay anyone to drag you in space? Well, you want to position yourself on the trajectory of approaching asteroids. And if you get close enough to those asteroids, you will be able to mine the, the, the tokens that are on those asteroids. So we started off with this uh, concept of uh, you launch your spaceship in the space, your spaceship is orbiting around a, a star, uh, many players are doing the same, your initial position is sort of random, and we have uh, asteroids popping up randomly and you need to get close to them. And then we observe what the players did. So. <laughs> 
So the players were leveraging their position when they were in a good spot, they were upping their price. When they were in the bad spot, they were uh, pushing their price down. Uh, they were anticipating where the, the asteroids were going to pass by and changing their price accordingly. So they were jumping from one solar system to another and collaborating with each other to do those jumps effectively. And then we started to host esports tournaments. So large scale tournaments where uh, up to 1,000 people play together at the same time. And that from uh, having 1,000 people playing on the same map is something that's really hard to do in the in the traditional gaming space. Well, it's weird. Tra after traditional finance, here comes the traditional gaming. <laughs> so traditional, traditional gaming, you have a server, you connect a certain number of players on the server. And if you want to connect thousands of players on the server, it's it starts to become a, a network challenge. Uh, connecting thousands of people on the blockchain is what the blockchain was made for. Uh, the only drawbacks is that the, the game cannot be cannot be entirely in real time. It has to be turn based or turn based with real time. So you can only do an action every four seconds. But we can adapt that to the gameplay so that it, it feels natural to play this way. So that was the the second game we published and. Uh, we had a we had a little success with this. About ten thousand players tried this game, um, and 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 gave us a lot of feedback to 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 build better games next. And the way we are going to continue onto this is uh, by building up an ecosystem of games that are all fitting together onto a, a large exploration space uh, drama and 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 role playing game. Uh, but every time we ship a, a, a standalone game that get plugged into the, the whole ecosystem and we battle test, battle test it and improve it as, uh, as time go. Okay. So Calmeth is, 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 is becoming or will become a, an, an ecosystem of games, all these sort of like mini, mini games or more or less big games, you know, like, uh, all in this ecosystem. And when you're playing, you know, there's interactions happening between those different games. So you might have like an MMORPG over here and you might like have some other sort of gameplay over here. And then these games sort of interact together uh, via the DeFi primitives that uh, exist um, underneath. Yeah, that's right. Imagine this, uh, imagine this, this flow, you, you arrive in the game, you get a basic introduction of what you can do with this. You are the captain of a spaceship. You can recruit uh, crew members, you can uh, equip your spaceship with uh, XYZ items, you can showcase your NFT in your in your spaceship, and you get to explore the space around you. You get to mine resources on, on different asteroids, you can get to go to a, a crafting bench where you can try to craft stuff. Um, and soon enough, you realize that there are guilds of players that you may join and have a, a more of a social experience. There are some quests that you can do and, and learn more about uh, the story behind the game or uh, the story behind the project financing this guild, for example, this guild or this quest. Um, you may you may encounter a another player that is aggressive and he will uh, ask you for a fight, or you may you may run into a an angry mob and have to have to fight this uh, this. Um, these opponents. Uh, but the fighting of an opponent is something that we call Cometh Battle, and Cometh Battle will be the, the next uh, mini game that we are going to release. And as we balance and, and improve this game, we will make it uh, make it fit fit into uh, the global exploration side of it. Mm. Um, you, you just said I, something here that, that just clicked with me, and, and when you said financing uh, guilds, and I, I couldn't help but just picture an ecosystem where you may have investors that are coming in and financing teams through a DAO and essentially getting like a return on that investment through through the DAO, just like you would finance like, you know, uh, uh, an esports team or anything like that. Uh, it's like, it's like, yeah, it's super interesting. Uh, it's just lots of different ideas come to mind here. Yep. Well, two, two, two approach to this, uh, one that we have already tried and another one that we will try in the short run is that, um, so some of the eSport tournaments that we had were uh, restricted in access to some kind of spaceships. So if you have a rare spaceship or a mythic spaceship, you can access the top tier tournaments. It means that only if you were able to uh, mint those those uh, rare NFTs or, or find them by chance or purchase them on the secondary market or on the primary market, you had access to those tournaments. Now, not all of the uh, top spaceship owner are the best players. So we created a, a rental system where a player can say, hey, here's my, 
here's my uh, Chancellor, a beautiful spaceship uh, that we are in the game. Uh, here's my Chancellor. Uh, if you want, you can rent my Chancellor, and I'm renting my ch Chancellor to any players that is, that is in the top 50 or the top 100. And we have a revenue sharing scheme where uh, you get 95% of your of your income with this spaceship, and I get 5%. Uh, and this was the, the rental service that we put in place for the for the first game. We are con co continuing to to build on top of it for the next game. But we want the the players that are investing in those NFTs that have effects from one game to another to also be able to feature them and 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 lend them to other players. Uh, some some armada some some guilds of players are uh, already accumulating some spaceships uh, in the in in in, in that view like preparing for for this kind of thing and the other thing we can do with uh, uh, you know what you mentioned about financing guilds and so on is that um, content creation can be brought into the game in the form of uh, NFT enhanced experience so. Um, let's say you have a, an Ave, Ave NFT, uh, like you equip this Ave NFT and now you get access to three or four uh, Ave quests. Uh, in those Ave quests, you get special things that were, uh, that were a special experience that was created by our team and the Ave team, uh, getting you to different systems, getting you to uh, different game mechanics. And at the end, if you manage to win the quest, you can win a little bit of Ave token or win access to a specific thing related to Ave. So it, it gives those um, social NFTs or just a beautiful piece of art NFT that were created by those projects also a game utility and uh, and can be enhanced with the rental service that you, you can say, well, I had this quest, I, I, I managed to go into this quest. So now I'm going to uh, I'm going to lend my NFT to Sebastian. So Sebastian also will have this, uh, this same experience as me. Hmm. How many users are playing the game and... I don't know if this. What is the game's market cap? <laughs> <laughs> so the 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 main game that we run from se February to September had uh, ten thousand unique players, with uh, only uh, a little bit a little bit more than four thousand spaceship minted. So the the rental service worked uh, worked very well. Uh, we had about five thousand rental contract that were created. So players had the uh, had the choice between. Uh, getting a really cheap spaceship and trying out the game in a in a in a reduced uh, area, like the, the the size of the game when you had this uh, nearly free spaceship or sometimes free spaceship is was was not really big, or they get to rent a better spaceship and and go uh, and go in the in the wild. So ten thousand players tried the game. Um, about two thousand played monthly um, at the peak of the game, and um, a little bit more than seven hundred were playing daily. The, the game was very active um, in terms of transaction being being signed and, uh, and sent to the blockchain. Uh, one of our key achievements is that we managed to to overflow the number of transactions counted on uh, on uh, on Polygon Scan. So here's for the here's for the achievement. For quite some time, it was saying minus one minus one transaction on the Must token. <laughs> Um, because when you are when you are interacting in the game, you have to transfer must to other players in order to to move. the The game token is called the must M U S T, and there is one million must in the <laughs> that have been minted uh, and will be ever minted. and And the price of the must, I think, today is one hundred and twenty dollar or something. Uh, now, when it comes to the locked value in the game, it's uh, difficult to answer because like the, most of the spaceship in the game are in the game uh, so does it count as value and uh, not all of the mass token has been distributed so who knows what's the what's the how, well it's difficult to find a, a good model to 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 have a to, to frame your your analysis hey it's okay what's the tvl what's the number of players okay let's go i mean no i'm out uh more on a on an activity based or on a on a content creation based maybe that's the that's the right approach to look at it that's cool. Um, so let's let's dive into like the you know the back end a little bit, like what's under the hood, and you know talk about the different DeFi primitives that exist, uh, sort of like underneath these games. So like I understand there's a um, there's an AMM, which is kind of like a a, a Uniswap clone, and does the renting like have some sort of a lending and borrowing protocol underneath it? Uh, uh, so the the rental system was uh, was bespoke. Um, the idea is that we create an account that um, that you transfer your um, 
Uh, so we create a smart contract account. You transfer your NFT to this smart contract account. Um, and then me as a, as a renter, I will look at the, the contract that are open for, for, for rental. Uh, they have a condition saying, if you want to rent this, uh, you send uh, the owner this amount of token to enter. And they have a, they have, they have a constraint on a, every time you mint something, um, a certain portion of what you've minted or what you, what you've gained in the game will be sent to the, to the owner as well. So the, the rental system, how it works is a simple externally owned account with different roles. The owner of the account, uh, will be the person that owned the NFT, but the operator of the account will be the, will be the, the rentee. And now this uh, rental account uh, manager whitelist, uh, that is the contract that the, that the person is allowed to interact with. And those contracts are the contract of the game, of course. Uh, so it's a straightforward way to do, to do rentals uh, uh, in the first place. Uh, we have some improvement and things we want to add to, uh, to this, uh, this rental system. And we'll work on this for the next version of the, of the rental system. On the side of this rental system, there is, a, as you mentioned, an IMM, a Uniswap fork. We, we, we call it Comet Swap. Uh, it's not, it's not CoSwap, it's Comet Swap. Um, and it's, uh, it's a decentralized exchange uh, built on top of Polygon at the moment. Um, and that lists a lot of uh, gaming projects in, um, in this IMM. Um, the reason why we wanted to have an IMM is that the, the fees that are generated by the IMM are sent into the game. So the more the activity of the AMM, the more the more things are sent into the game, and also we we rely on the AMM to um, to to create game experiences. So in the in the in the next version of the game, something that we are working on right now uh, actually um, is the crafting system. So when you have two resources, you can combine them into a new item. But how much of uh, resource A and how much of resource B you need to put in is actually based on the state of the pool from A to B in the AMM. So we rely on the on the routing on the routing of the AMM uh, to, to 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 create dynamic recipes for items. So this way we are uh, stabilizing the economy of the game so that uh, if there is an excess of any resources, uh, it translates itself into uh the not it doesn't translate into uh an excess of any items that can be crafted with those resources and when you dig deeper and deeper on uh, on on applying uh decentralized finance uh services whether it's in-house or or third party based uh into a game economy you you find out that you can build um game economy that are much more advanced and and resilient than existing games so uh, crafting system is uh, only ex an example, but we can, uh, we, can, we can look at different, different topics on, in the same way. The next step for us will also be uh, to, to give access uh, directly from the premises of the game um, to some, uh, some, some, some other services like Aave, like Pickle Finance, like SushiSwap, like StakeDAO and so on, to make sure that our players, while they are playing, are also getting into educated on what they can do with that token or what they can do with them. So, I mean, why did you build your own AMM though? And, and like, and I mean, because like, there's so much more liquidity in 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 other AMMs. Like, are you are you able to tap into some of that liquidity elsewhere? Or and, and I guess like, there's an I, I, if if all these primitives exist already, what's to stop someone from building a game like on top of Ave or on top of like you know Uniswap well, or any other like existing DeFi primitive? <laughs> they, they they should definitely. Um, so one of the one of the driver for us was to be able to properly manage our own token list. Um, so it's 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 in the white paper. So I'm not I'm not giving away any alpha here. But uh, whenever we integrate new resources, so like we are going to use the whole uh, chemical um, chemical elements as resources in the game. So we want to make sure that uh, we so have a like you're mining gold, you're mining silver, gold and you're titanium, mining gold and uranium. Okay. Okay. So you have okay. gold and uranium. Uh, okay. So like it's those are new tokens that we need to list. Uh, we wanted to to have the end on uh, how much a trading fees was sent to the LPs, how much trading fees was sent to the game itself. We we tried to make a link between. Uh, Having the NFT and uh, and and having a, a say in the game, having a stake in the game. So uh, the the fees that those simple DeFi primitive collects 
are, are meant to be redistributed to the players or are meant to go either directly or through the game to the players. So relying on uh, on another on a third party DEX for the for the IMM was clearly not considering this IMM as a public utility for the whole uh, for the whole game. Uh, which it which which it came into came into um, came clearly as pr pretty soon when we when we started to uh, to conceptualize the game. Um, on the other side, uh, having um, having having lending protocols um, is really it is really hard if you don't have the proper liquidity. Today, the, the game can very well live with uh, with not so big liquidity, not not so big. Uh, not not so big um, volume because uh, it's restricted to the community of players we have, and so uh, I think we we are we are very very happy by running our own decks at the moment. Uh, it may it may change in the future, but it also facilitates so many things in terms of integration and, and ease of use for our players that it's 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 fine to do so. Um, but I think the next uh, the next play, uh, if we were starting to have liquidity problem, would be to to use an aggregator like one inch or power swap, and expose that to the players. It's just that the token that we want to feature, the token that we want to showcase, we want to to have direct access to to them and and to how the the IMM is dealing with them. Also, if you want to do some um, some. Um, Liquidity mining operations, like uh, giving away some mass to some liquidity providers, it's much easier to have the end on your own IMM in this case. Mm. And right now, it's not a, it's not too cumbersome for us to to ent entertain it and, man and manage it. Uh, so we will continue this way, I think. So, so you mentioned must. Um, so talk a little bit about the the native token or uh, tokens must and dust. Uh, what are the roles in the game, and how do they interact with each other? So the 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 must token is the the utility token of the game, um, and when you are staking must, you are getting dust. Now, what can you do with the must? Uh, in the must, with the must, you can pay for in-game transactions. So most of the of the game product or most of the services in the game are. Uh, labeled in in must. So if I wanted to come close to your spaceship, I would have to pay you in must. Um, and the dust token, when you are not using your must, just stake your must and, and get some dust. And with the dust token, you can redeem new NFTs or you can uh, redeem some, uh, some, some operations in the game, uh, like new spaceships or, uh, a new piece of art from the game or uh, some advantages. So like participating, getting a ticket for the next tournament, you get that by, by staking must. Uh, and using your dust uh, in that uh, in that respect, uh, the dust is a is a transitionary um, token for for us um, because we are um, we are about to, uh, to to run our own scalability solution or to 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 use our own scalability solution and use that scalability solution to to really give a free to play experience to our player. So one of the things that we haven't chatted about yet is uh, how expensive it is for a a user to actually play on the blockchain. Um, well, you have to pay for your transaction. <laughs> that's, that's the thing. So if you are going to bring people from outside the, the, the blockchain space into the blockchain space with your game, you have to figure out how you want to make sure that they are, they are, they are paying for the transaction or they've paid for the fees of the transaction. So when you look at, um, at, at, Companies like, uh, well, games like Axie Infinity or, or what, uh, what, um, the NBA Top Shot and, 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 and Lava Labs uh, games are, are doing. Uh, they are running their own infrastructure because they want to make sure that the players are actually having this free to play experience. But at the same time, you want to limit them into how many actions they want to do because you don't want anyone to spam your chain when you are, when you are running this chain. Um, so we see Dust as a good way also to, um, to meter the user's activity. So in the in the next game, what's going to happen is that if you are staking must, you are getting dust. And when you are using uh, the, the when, when you are playing, you can actually uh, rely on the dust that you have accumulated to pay for your transaction. Yeah, so I hadn't considered the transaction fees actually. Like yeah. every action needs to pay for transaction fees. <laughs> you would you would you would feel that uh, being on Polygon, you get no transaction fees, but yeah, the, 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 this chain is, uh, is victim of its success. Uh, it's getting more and more expensive for players to, um, 
to, to, to transact on this chain. And uh, at Cometh, we, we are looking at optimistic product solutions, whether it is optimism of our off-chain lab. Uh, we spent a week in Lisbon uh, doing tryouts uh, on our own fork of Arbitrum. Uh, we will continue to test other solutions like Startnet and trying to figure out how we can best pay for the infrastructure of our player. So the, the ideal situation would be that you are a new player, you are getting a, you are getting a free spaceship, you are exploring the game, you are starting to like blockchain. Um, it's amazing, but you know, you've done 10 or 20 transactions today and I will tell you like, Hey, tomorrow, uh, you'll have 10 new transactions, but we will only pay for 10 transactions per day. If you want to do more, just stake some must and you'll get a, you get access to this infrastructure that we are paying for our players. Yeah, I want to I want to come back to the to the scalability and like the, this this Arbitrum fork that you're working on, um, but uh, but before that, I, I I'm I'm really kind of interested in this. I guess it's the the permissionlessness that comes around this. So like, there, there's two aspects. One is like we discussed earlier, you know, people could start building you know interfaces on top of existing DeFi protocols, and like you said, they should, and and you know this might happen as I guess as um, as these platforms move on to layer twos where transaction fees are lower, there's more there's more scalability and where composability is maintained, right? So like if you have like a bunch of DeFi platforms like on uh, Polygon or some other layer two, then the opportunity opens up for people to start building like games or other like interesting interfaces on top of these things. But then there's also the other uh, aspect, which I think is interesting and, and really lends itself well to gaming. And that is that players could build their own sort of in-game assets by minting their own NFTs and building their own um, assets. And it, it's kind of similar to how um, people like have been building game mods like for, mm -hmm. you know, for, for yeah, so many years, right? Like all these game mods that exist and all the games that, you know, people play. You know, you know what, what's I'm the level of permissionlessness here that exists? Like, can can people just start building their own assets? They they definitely can. Uh, like, there's there's no limit into it. Uh, right now, the the next iteration of the game, like the come of battle, um, so the battle system of the game that we will release pretty soon. I uh, I think it's a matter of, of weeks now. Well, we we look at all the NFTs that you have on your wallet, and we let you use those NFTs as skins. And, and even mint real in-game items from them uh, if you fit certain conditions. So if you decided to create an NFTs of your T-shirt, uh, you can potentially use this T-shirt as, as something you, you put on the wall in your spaceship or something that you showcase to other players when you are playing against them. Um, but that's that's only a, a first. I mean, uh, the, all, the whole scholar system of Axie Infinity was built by fans. People wanted to to use this and wanted, wanted that to happen. And uh, the team was busy delivering something else. So they just let the modders uh, create their own mod and create what is now uh, a key features of Axie Infinity. Um, I'm, I'm not 100% familiar with uh, the, the game mods economy. Um, I think there is a distribution scheme that is available in, uh, in in Steam and so on if you want to sell some skins, if you want to s s sell some, uh, some some stuff. Uh, but it's it's much better from a, from a blockchain perspective to, to to be able to directly incentivize people to um, to actually build stuff. So we are, are, we are very proud of uh, our crafting system uh, and we are sure that people will start building on top of it saying like, hey, I'll get the crafting system optimizer. It will look at the stages of the market for all the items that uh, are available and will and we'll tell you to craft XYZ and put them on the market directly. Uh, like it would be pretty cool to build that. Uh, we won't have time to build it, but like anyone can build it and it's uh, it's just relying on basic DeFi primitives. So just go on and build it. Uh, yeah. If you end up having something yeah, super it's cool, cool like this. It's cool. So they consider the yeah. overlap that, that can then happen between like different games. So like, you know, there could be like Comet and then some other games and the composability allows for those skins and those mods to overlap and to like yeah. jump into other game ecosystems and like uh, universes. Uh, so I think that's like a really interesting idea. Yeah, it's... it's um from from a yeah from commerce perspective it's uh, it's an amazing way to do cross pollinization like uh, say we create a, a set of, uh, of of quests for anyone that has a, a doki doki finance nft 
pretty cool Gacha points, uh, Gacha point project where you put some coins in a, in the Gacha point machine and, uh, and the Gacha point give you uh, a, a special NFT. So we could very well uh, build up a, a collaboration, whether it is decentralized, permissionless, or really centralized. Like, hey, it's it's us from the commerce team talking to the Doki Doki finance team and telling them like, hey, let's do something. Like, uh, we create a special quest for for your for your uh, NFTs, and uh, anyone that has these NFTs in their wallet can have access to these special quests. Or maybe we have it as a as a community request. Like, uh, we realize that all of our Community members have uh, Doki Doki Finance NFTs. Well, uh, they are going to ask us to uh, put that on the roadmap. Like, hey, create special content if we have uh, this kind of NFTs, and uh, maybe we can just uh, do a, a call for call, call for content. Like, guys, we have a uh, 10k to spare on creating this content. Like, uh, we want to take it out, and, uh, to, and and yeah, it's 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 a way to make the game evolve uh, by getting the community directly involved. Um, which can be could be done so by, with a, in a centralized manner, but it can be done in a much much more streamlined manner with the blockchain. Uh, I, I remember the, the the days where we had a bounty network uh, product that was unfortunately stopped, but uh, it was really good to to find freelancers. Like you can just ask for a task on bounty network, and you grow your network of freelancers, and eventually you find even full time employee for this way. So I'm I'm really keen to see where the the whole gaming ecosystem will be in the next uh, in the next six to twelve months because they will get integrated pretty fast. So you um, so Cometh was was launched uh, on Polygon and mm -hmm. then now you're getting ready to launch your own Arbitrum fork. Uh, how important was it for you to have your own L2, and what are some of the challenges that come with that? Running our own infrastructure for the players are is, is getting more and more of a necessity. We haven't really set our mind into whether we're going to use this technology or that technology or whether those technologies are going to be mature enough so that they can even service us for that. Um, but it's now become clear to us that um, from a user experience, we we cannot um, we cannot not be on our own infrastructure. Uh, if we could, we were running on our own um, Ethereum shard and, and be with all the game on the Ethereum shard. Uh, but that's that's not going to happen between uh, now and probably the next 18 or, or 24 months. So looking at um, what big projects like uh, like like Flow and Ronin did to, to their respective games, um, you, you, you become the master of the infrastructure for your players. So Polygon is, is an, a very good scalability solution. It's, it's a very good way of getting more throughput for your users and the, the success that they have in terms of, uh, of number of daily active address is just mind blowing because so many people were uh, wanting to move their ETH, wanting to move their token and use products that they couldn't on the, on, on the Ethereum mainnet because of the fees. Um, but yet, uh, putting so much throughput, like one block every four seconds, leads to to RPC problems, leads to uh, to some network instability, and also to the network getting getting more and more expensive. Uh, don't get me don't get me wrong. It's it's very fine. It's very cheap, and it's working very well for for your daily usage on on Polygon. Uh, but from from a, a game developer perspective, we cannot say to our players like. Well, guys, we're sorry. The the RPC endpoint is it's down. We run our own and we pay for a subscription. But those days, it's not that good. Or oh, we sorry today there was a crash on the market, so everybody is super active and the gas price is not thirty gigaway, it's two thousand gigaway. Uh, and it happened on Ethereum. It happened on Polygon as well. So we would like to be able to to completely separate the the game activity from the on chain activity, but still keeping the game activity based in the blockchain. So the, the, the games that we developed have their game state stored in the blockchain, executed and stored in the blockchain. Uh, all the DeFi primitives need to stay in, uh, in, in, in sidechains or, 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 or mainnets or whatever you want to call them that have bigger security primitives. But we want to have the game happening and the game interaction happening in an infrastructure that we can uh, we we can pay for uh, and 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 we can and we can maintain for our players, 
So uh, optimistic rollups at, at large are a very interesting solution for this um, because they, they they offer the security primitive that uh, you can get out without us uh, through the through the, the trustless bridge. Uh, it takes some time, but you don't have to trust us for this. Or you can accept to trust us, and we are a liquidity provider in and out. And compared to the ZK rollups, uh, we imagine that we are going to have to change the, uh, quite often our contracts. So it may be a better, a better, a better proposition of, uh, of value for us to use optimistic rather than ZK. But we are going to do some triads on the ZK rollups as well to make sure that uh, we are not missing something. And, and, and yes, yeah, so, um, uh, as you mentioned, it's, uh, it's, it's, we, we are getting into, uh, Arbitrum and, uh, we think that the Option Lab team is, uh, really proficient into what they do. Um, I hope that in the short run we'll have uh, dedicated uh, rollup deployers, uh, rollup maintainers that, that can service applications like us. Uh, till then, we are doing our R&D and, uh, and continuing to improve uh, the, the future infrastructure that we will be deployed on. Um, but it's, mm. it's good for us to be able to say to our players, oh guys, we're sorry, uh, the sequencer is down. Uh, so no in and outs over the next two hours. It's our problem and here's updates on what's going on. Rather than, uh, having to rely on a third party telling us, uh, that, oh, keep, 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 stay tuned. We are going to update you and so on. Uh, we want to be responsible for this. It's, uh, it's better for the overall, uh, overall experience. Are you concerned that? Because like one one thing that I think is really important here, and if we go back to what we discussed earlier, and like all of the uh, composability and the interactions with like other NFTs outside of the um, Cometh ecosystem, and interaction with AMMs, etc. Like as this ecosystem grows, are you concerned about composability starting to present a problem? Because like if all of your stuff is on one um, layer two. You know, you need to create bridges basically with all the other layer twos yeah. or all the other platforms. How does that like? Work? Yeah, so it's it's definitely a, it's definitely an issue. Um, so also also something that make us a little bit more bullish for our use case on optimistic than on ZKs. Uh, like I said, it's we are it's not a it's not set in stone. We are, we are trying out and, and and considering different options. Uh, but the composability uh, inside uh, an optimistic rollup is quite more doable, uh, as far as far as I know for the moment. Um, so that's that's one thing. Um, and then, if you put yourself in the shoes of the players and uh, you're like getting uranium, getting uh, getting gold, uh, crafting this uh, new new. Uh, New thruster uh, with uranium and gold, and uh, putting that on the market, and uh, or using that for yourself. And at some point, you get bored with the game, and you want to sell those those items. While well, you say those items on OpenSea, or let it get in market, and you get some ETH, or you get some Matic for it, or you get USDC for it, uh, and then you want to do something with those tokens that you had. Uh, you want to put them on Aave, you want to put them on SushiSwap. Well. Uh, we are not going to 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 beg uh, those projects to come and be live on our rollup, and I mean they, they they should stay where they are and they should follow their own lead. Uh, but as long as the the rollup or the scalability solution that we use is plugged into a a bigger chain with all of those public utility, uh, we can streamline the interactions between the rollup and those public utilities for them, and give them a good experience on on using that, and eventually also paying for the gas. To, for them, uh, so that they can they can they can use it for almost free, um, and then the composability problem. We are coming back to uh, to how we uh, to how we frame the thing from a user perspective. Uh, the player profile for us should be an externally owned account, uh, where he or she um, has a has a good way of of logging in and using a a, a game only wallet that uh, it's. Can can be connected with your email or can be connected with a notification on the phone or something that is really handy and that you don't have to carry over a, a specific IoT for it, whether it is Ledger or Trezor. Uh, but once you are creating your user profile, well, why don't you declare that you want the all the withdraw to go to this account that you secure with a Ledger, or why don't you want to say that? Uh, uh, you have this, uh, this is your Polkadot, uh, uh, address and, and you have lots of Polkadot NFT on it. Or this is your Tezos address and you have lots of, uh, Tezos NFT on it. So once you declare that, uh, from your player profile, for us, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not easy, but it's, it's, it's doable to, to fetch the data that you have on your wallet and tell you like, oh, that's cool. You have this, uh, 
um, this, this Tezos NFT, like, uh, do you want to showcase it in the game? Like, you know, you can use it. Um, that's fine. Like, we, we collect those data for the players and we give them a, an, an enhanced experience, uh, just looking at the other wallets that they have. Now, for, of course, uh, getting, getting real composability, uh, not just read, but also write, um, it's going to pose challenges. I don't know where it will be going. Uh, if there is any any good project or good a uh, good initiative to to enhance the the composability from a right perspective between different chain, uh, we would gladly uh, participate to a, a, a Gitcoin uh, operation with them or or give away some some funding and grants for for this because it's going to be key in the future. As uh, I don't expect the, the blockchain system to over. Uh, centralized or, 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 or over merge into just having two winners, Bitcoin and Ethereum. Uh, all the chains are here to stay and all the solutions are here to stay and for the greater good because they all have a specific value proposition for the users. So let me ask you this. If you had not been so invested in Ethereum and, you know, uh, like in, in that ecosystem, Try, try, try to extract your, you know, Jerome de Tisha, <laughs> the, the guy who's like, you know, launched Ethereum France from from your personality. Uh, yeah, like, why why not build this on like something like Solana or on Cosmos, oh. where transaction scalability <laughs> is like not an issue, and you have full composability uh, with other apps? Like, te- technically speaking, I'm just like playing devil's advocate here. Like, technically speaking, that feels to me like a better. Uh, solution because you don't have this uh, issue with cons- composability, but especially with a game where um, you know the cost of transactions needs to be super low, uh, near zero, and you you have lots of transactions. It's like every action is a transaction. So we we are not not building on Solana. We we may or may not be build, we may be building on Solana in the future. Uh, that's that's still a possibility for us. How to how to, how I can to take see that the inner that. contradictions. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's a bit it's a bit early for us not to to go on a micro chain like Ethereum. When you want to build on a new chain, uh, and by new chain I say uh, not fully not fully EVM compatible chain, so not an EVM chain. My my own experience with uh, s- starting in the early days to to do some Tezos stuff, some Cosmos stuff, some Polkadot stuff. Um, I've, I've run nodes on those chains. I've tried to, I, I, I want to experience the chain by myself. I want to run a node. I want to try to do smart contract. I want to install the wallet. I want to like spare $20 of uh, the local token and try to use apps and make my own decision, make my own feeling about this. Um, we haven't tried enough, uh, deeply enough Solana to, to have a, to have a final decision on where, if it's good or not to go there, but, but trying out other protocols, like the the experience was all the time the same. Like the first years, there is a there is a need for standardization, a need for reusable code, a need for reusable audited, audited public utilities code uh, that you can you can pick and, and install. Um, you need to have a good access to a wallet, and I, I heard very good thing about Solana's wallet, by the way. Um, before you decide to put. Uh, five person full time on, on translating your stack into this new chain. What's good about Ethereum and the EVM franchise is that everything is already built up and everything is being redeployed. So I go on uh, on, on near protocol, I go on Ave, uh, on, on Avalanche, I go on uh, on whatever EVM chains, uh, I, I got my own, uh, I got the, the old comfort, the, the, the comfort of having access to sushi swap to, to, to curve and Aave. Um, I got access to, uh, the, the, the ERC, uh, 71 and 1155 standard that deployed everywhere. I got also sometimes access to a good market like, uh, like OpenSea. So it feels just direct to go there. Um, because we are at a stage of maturity where we are not preparing for having 10,000 users. We are preparing for having 200,000 users. So from a strategic perspective, do I go on a chain that already has those 2,000 users and I'm going to to try to get a, 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 a subset of them? Or do I go on a chain that I've just launched with uh, many promises, many good people building on top of it and, and that may or may not be there when I'm ready to go there? Um, it's it's a, it's a tough strategic decision to take, um, and also 
you get pressure from your community, from your investors, from uh, whoever saying, you should really go on Solana because it's new and it's great. Or you should really go on Definity because it's new and it's great. Um, but then when it comes to politicization, uh, you, you want to have the product that works. And we've seen so many, so many projects that uh, are super ambitious in what they want to deliver uh, and encounter so many blockers, so many things that they need to solve before, before be, being even ready to ship. Uh, we don't want to fall into that trap. Uh, we ship and ship and ship and ship. And at some point, if we encounter a big problem, we switch to another chain. But focus on shipping and, and having things that can be used by our, by our, by our users. Well, as an investor, that's the answer I wanted to hear. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think like I think you're right that you know, you get the you get all the stack that comes with the EV, like being in the EVM franchise. Um, well, we should we should make yeah. sure that we are not uh, we are not getting uh, resting too much. Like uh, yeah, it's the EVM franchise. Everything is ready. So are we are we being um, are we being too comfy or? so comfy that we don't want to use something else uh, we, we need we need to to to, to stay curious and, and continue to try out new things yeah yeah i mean I, I, my my i guess like the thing that i see as the biggest advantage of being on you know a, a chain like like solana or even like building a cosmos um sdk chain is the the user experience of um Especially when attracting new like non crypto users, because like we are we're all you know familiar with transaction transaction fees and like moving things in and out of Polygon and Arbitrum and like having to bridge and, and this sort of thing, but to uh, to a novice user or like a total like non blockchain user who's just like hey this is a cool game uh, I heard it uses a blockchain but like I just want to play this game, all those it, c layers of complexity. Um, are, are unknown and then you know as a game developer you kind of have to like <laughs> like build the game dynamics that kind of like okay. mask those so it's like moving to another <laughs> like another galaxy is like bridging over to another thing like you have to create and it, so there's like it's it's there's two parts to that there's one is okay it, it, it gives opportunity it creates opportunities to create interesting game dyma dynamics in terms of the interface but at the same time it's like all this kind of technical complexity yeah well, let me. Uh, well, the, all the NFTs or the spaceship NFTs that we've minted are uh, initially minted on Ethereum because we we don't want we don't want to have them. We want we want to have them uh, to give, to give them the a, a canonical existence on the biggest available chain. Okay, well, that's right. We mint on Ethereum, so we started to mint on Ethereum in in July in 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 January, uh, twenty twenty one. Some people bought those NFTs and we were saying to them, hey, in four weeks, we are launching the first version of the game. It's going to be on Polygon. It's going to be super fun, but let's let's go. And then the, the, the date arrived. I think it was the 9th of February. And we're like, okay, guys, the bridge is ready. Uh, we had deployed the bridge. We had, uh, we had uh, made sure that our contracts were both on Polygon and on, uh, and on Ethereum. Um, yeah, well, that's that's another constraint that we haven't mentioned is that uh, if you are not running your own um, your, your own infrastructure on the on the scalability solution that you are going to use, uh, you need to rely on the the, the team behind this uh, the core team behind this uh, scalability solution that you are using and uh, get some of their bandwidth and ask, hey, do you want to like hey, please help me out? I need I need a copy of my ERC seven to one contract here and there. So another hurdle that you have to deal with. But then the date arrived, the bridge opened, and you'd say to people like, hey guys, send your spaceship on Polygon. First step. Well, no, sorry, approve the sending of your spaceship on Polygon. Send your spaceship on Polygon. Okay, now um, switch your uh, MetaMask to Polygon. And we were one of the of the, of the supporters of the, uh, the, the pull request on MetaMask to make sure that uh, we can push the change of uh, of network directly on metamask which wasn't available before february so imagine sorry so to change the network you have to open the network tab in the parameters of your metamask and add this add that oh damn the the, the pop-up just closed so you have to do it all over again oh my god then now you're on polygon uh thanks god polygon is giving out uh, one one matic to everyone that's new to the chain so you have some matic to pay for a transaction 
good for you. So now you go on the website of Kamef and uh, you, you approve your spaceship and now finally you send your spaceship in, in, in play. So who in their right mind would do five transactions between two networks in order to play a game? <laughs> Yet we had to bring people to do that. So it was, it was so cumbersome. Um, and unfortunately, on the 9th of February, we had a little dip on the market and the gas price went from uh, 30 degree away to 200. And people were like, I cannot play. It's too complicated. Uh, but luckily for us, like the Avegochi guys, at their community do that the same day as us. So we, we tried to hold our hands and, and, and push the people to do that. But yeah, it's it's so so much trouble, so much uh, so, so many things to, to do from one chain to another that um, it made us realize that we want to keep the users at the same place as much as possible and only get them through these kind of hurdles when uh, they are about to do an action that's going to benefit them financially uh, at first. So keeping the game on a scalable infrastructure and keeping the keeping the, 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 the DeFi and blockchain stuff and also blockchain stuff on another infrastructure that has better security primitives. We're trying to stay pragmatic there. So maybe not so the next month, but uh, who knows, maybe one day. <laughs> Cool. Well, I'd like to take a step back here because we're, we're we're running low on time. We've actually gone over the the time that we usually uh, you know suspend on these episodes, but uh, we'll we'll go over a little bit. You know, like I I I'd like to ask you, like, if you look at if you look at the the gaming industry, like it's a multi billion dollar industry, and like I see ads for these kinds of games all the time, right? Like the Ages of Empire and like all these farming games and whatever, and like people play these games and they spend lots of money like buying basically the currency that allows them to like play this game, and um, you know this is an entirely new model where well there. Uh, there's more interaction and interop interoperability between, you know, different games. So, like, games are not siloed. The ability for users to generate content and then sell that content on secondary markets or, and even have that content interact yeah. between the games is much higher. So there's less friction and, like, less siloed ecosystems. Um you know, does the gaming industry, the current gaming industry, and particularly like the mobile gaming industry, which is massive... Do they have an incentive to move towards a model like this, or does it really disrupt their model uh, fundamentally? Like, uh, wh wh where where is the industry heading in terms of like siloed uh, ecosystems? So, yeah, I'm glad we still have time because it's it's not a yes no question, is it? <laughs> yeah, no. So, uh, so my my. My, my my gaming years, I was uh, playing uh, Warcraft, Warcraft Three, Frozen Throne, Warcraft and and Frozen Throne. Uh, f yeah, that's that was like year two thousand, two thousand two, three. Uh, and then the this massive games called the World of Warcraft just happened, uh, dra dragged thousands and millions of players there, um, and. This is where we get the first cryptocurrency. I'm not the I'm not the first one saying that, but like the gold of World of Warcraft was sold on eBay. Um, it was it was a currency that has value that has, was being transferred between players way before Bitcoin. Um, I think Vitalik famously said that uh, he, he he got into blockchain because he was he was uh, tired of uh, having his favorite characters being nerfed in World of Warcraft. In and players that were selling their accounts, selling their best gears, or selling gold, and, and and being convicted by Blizzard, got their account bound or or got their their, their subscription terminated. We are going from there to a massive interconnected uh, game asset industry uh, that's going to definitely change how the what what the business the classic business model for a game is. So I, I understand that uh, if if uh, if Blizzard is looking at me, Jerome, just join World of Warcraft, play play three more three weeks, and be like, well, I want to be level sixty right away. And Sebastian is selling his account, so yeah, how much do you want for your account? Two hundred dollar? Yeah, set down. I'm I'm buying your account. And Blizzard will say like, well, now Jerome is level sixty, he will have access to the the final stages of the game, uh, but I 
couldn't have milked Jerome for uh, 12 months is, uh, on his way from level zero to 60. So like my subscription model is, uh, is done. Like, uh, the subscription is your NFT. The subscription is your account. You are selling your account. You're giving away a subscription to someone else. Luckily, like I, I can, I can, as, as a, as a blockchain game studio, I can say, well, I get two or three percent on every trade on the secondary market. As long as you do it in, in my market, you can go OTC, of course, but, uh, I can maybe get a, get a, get a few, uh, a few pieces of revenue on this secondary market. And, I'm, I'm very, uh, willing to take this trade off of putting everything out of the market and liber liberalize it. Um, and just getting a cut, even a small cut on the volume that going to uh, help the studio continue to create content for those assets. I think that's a, a, a much more sustainable, uh, sustainable, uh, uh, model than trying to, uh, systematically appeal to, 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 to tricks. Uh, to um, psychologic tricks to to keep people from playing and uh, and, and buying and and being uh, and being uh, addicted to the to the game and to the mechanism of the game just by saying hey this is out uh, you're paying for the NFT once uh, you are paying for some transaction eventually you can resell your NFTs you can do this you can do that it's an open market and we are building an infrastructure for those NFTs and those tokens so come and have fun with us and if you like what you're say, saying well you are a community member you are a member of this infrastructure as we are and we are here to continue delivering content to you um so i i really hope that uh, we'll see a supercharged version of uh, successful mobile games that we see today but with a blockchain with a blockchain state with a, with a blockchain mindset and um and yeah let's let's see if uh, if 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 apple apple uh, uh, Apple Store and and I and and Google Store will will let us leave there, uh, but as long as they do, I I don't see why we we wouldn't su su succeed in this. Uh, so yeah, I, don't, I I know that Apple did uh, appeal to the decision of uh, of uh, I I don't remember which which trial it was that uh, said that they shouldn't take thirty percent on every in-game transaction or in-app purchase. Uh, yeah, it's the whole but, Fortnite thing. Yeah, Epic Games. Yeah, yeah, but Epic Games seems to be very open to this. Um, so definitely Epic Games is a place where NFT games is going to thrive. Um, I hope, uh, iOS and, uh, and, and Google Store will be the same. Uh, so just, uh, crossing fingers there and, uh, hoping for the best for the gaming industry on, uh, with a blockchain mindset. Yeah. I mean, the, the mobile ecosystem and the, like the mobile stores essentially like are, I think like one of the big barriers to this taking off i think like it, it it may take a while i mean at, at some point in in the, in the past you know bitcoin wallets were uh forbidden from from the apple app store <laughs> yeah. that has changed um and there does seem to be a shift now with like there's new rules now about apple um letting um app makers uh, uh like allowing them to get their customers to go outside the, the app to uh, to pay so there does seem to be a shifting mindset. And as crypto becomes, I think, more um, mainstream, these things are also going to, you know, yep. come with their own uh, their own complexities, but also like probably open up a little bit more, I think. You also said like, uh, would, will, the, will, the, will the current games, mobile games adapt to blockchain? Uh, there's a there's a fairly good reason for them to adapt because the 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 community the blockchain community the people that are having tokens on their wallets the the, the millions uh, I don't think it's a hundred of million people but the millions of people that have ether on their wallets are actually a community that is really loving crypto really loving blockchain uh, and they want to play blockchain stuff they want they want to play blockchain games. So there are a niche of its own uh, that needs to be serviced, that needs to be entertained with proper games. Uh, so that, that's why blockchain games are, are thriving in the first place, in my opinion. Uh, and, and mobile game developers should definitely look at this niche uh, and, and, and try to address them with a blockchain-minded game. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it, it's, it's a good trend, and I hope we will meet them halfway, like uh, us blockchain-native 
companies trying to build games that is played by uh, your 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 sister-in-law and your mother-in-law and your nephew that uh, didn't know anything about blockchain but like hey it's a blockchain game i want to try it out and on the other other side of the spectrum uh, the game game loft and the likes that will say well that's cool i can build uh, candy crush chain or candy crush at candy crush at Hey, it's Candy Crush yet? Uh, it's Candy Crush, but on the blockchain, on the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, yeah, let's let's just do this and uh, and, and try to appeal to this uh, uh, emerging community that is uh, wants to have fun with our, with our, with, our, with our games on mobile. Yeah, I mean, I think there's no doubt that you know there's an opportunity here for you know uh, gaming studios to do this. Now, whether or not they will do that shift, I mean, essentially, like these these are now like very big companies with hundreds and thousands of employees investors, some of the republic traded companies. Taking that sort of risk, I think, is not uh, open to all of them. I mean, like, you know, even like a company like Ubisoft, which is right just down the down the road from here, um, you know, they have uh, a sort of blockchain yep. studio innovation lab and like they're doing some interesting things, but like they're they they have like that that is a very complex uh, sort of strategic shift, I think, for a company to say, like, okay, now we're moving everything onto blockchain. It's a risk. And I don't see, like, lots of companies doing that. And I think that there will be some form of disruption here in the space. I'm not saying, like, all gaming companies are going to, uh, sure. like, uh, stop existing tomorrow, but there will be, like, a good set of them that where their model is getting disrupted from this in the next, like, five to ten years. And shout out to uh, to, to Ubisoft because they, they launched their Rabbids uh, as NFTs on Ethereum during HCC this year. Uh, and all the proceeds of these NFT sales are going to UNICEF, another GNO that, uh, that really, uh, that really was into blockchain that created a, UNICEF created a blockchain funds for, uh, for, for emerging countries. So they, they are definitely, uh, Ubisoft is definitely going, uh, going deep into this technology and, and experimenting with it and getting ready for, uh, whenever they will, uh, think their, their community is, is mature to, to be, to, to be using those tools. Um, so that's, uh, that's definitely something that's, that's going to happen. I think, uh, I'm glad they are down the road and, uh, can't wait to, to have opportunities to collaborate with them. Cool. Well, we're, we're definitely pushing the limits here of the, <laughs> the, the length of this podcast. Uh, but no, it's super interesting. I think like it, it just, um, it's just a testament to the fact that we haven't really done a lot of content on, on gaming. And I, I mean, I come at this from like a non gamer perspective. Cause I, I don't play <laughs> games. I mean, I play them once in a while. Like I'll play, I don't know, something on my phone or, well, but I've never played. Block I've never really is, been... a, is a crypto game, right? It's opening <laughs> golf. Oh, wow. <laughs> what are going to happen? Yeah. You get yeah. Lots of emotion every time you open. But you know, it, so. I never got into the whole, like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I see, like I never got into the whole world of Warcraft thing or whatever, but I, I still like, I'm a, an observer of the fa- space. And like one of my good friends worked at Ubisoft. And so like, I think it's a, it's an interesting industry, and so like I think that's why there's, there's so much here to discuss. But um, before we wrap up, like uh, you know, what, what's coming up for Comet in the next you know year? What's the roadmap here? And then I, I I think you guys are hiring, so maybe this is your chance to make a call to our audience. Yeah, so uh, we're definitely hiring. Uh, we're definitely. Uh we are, we are hiring for lots of roles. Uh, if you want to do data on, data on blockchain, data analytics on blockchain, we are looking for, for guys to do this. We're looking for any, any, any full stack dev that's, uh, that is passionate about blockchain, passionate about gaming and wants to, to get their hands on. They, they get, they want to get their hands dirty. Reach out to me. We have, uh, we have roles open for this. If you have more of a, of a, of a uh, product or, or strategy, strategy mindset, do reach out as well. Uh, the way we like to enhance the team is just meeting people, meeting people that are passionate about what they want to do with us, um, and just growing the team and just not specifically opening roles and, and try to, to grow from here. The next steps for us is, um, doing a little release probably at the CoinGecko conference happening on the 16th of November. Uh, so do, do, do stay tuned because we will have uh, lots of announcement there. If you want to keep track of the game development, you can go on cometh.io. And uh, subscribe to the mailing list. You will also receive some NFTs if you subscribe there. So do do, do subscribe. Uh, we want to have a, a, a big product launch in Q1 uh, 2022. Uh, so that's that's part of the next steps for us. 
Um, and uh, another shout out to 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 Gnosis uh, for sponsoring this episode first, uh, but also for the the awesome work that they are doing not only on on CowSwap but also on Gnosis Guild. Uh, that's definitely the type of uh, utility that uh, we are going to try to use uh, for our guild needs on uh, on 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 Comet. Um, and yeah, Sebastian, thanks again uh, for thanks again for having me. Uh, it was a it was a pleasure being there. It was a pleasure to finally be at uh, at Epicenter after listening to so many uh, of of your episodes. Uh, I mean, technically, and- you've already been on episode twice. So. Oh. <laughs> Well, yeah, but interview for HCC does it? Count? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah it kind of con- counts. Like, yeah. congrats to the to the whole Epicenter team for uh, being such a long-standing quality podcast. I hope uh, I contributed to the quality of this podcast. <laughs> and uh, and uh, yeah, thanks for everything. I think so. Yeah, I mean, I, I hopefully this will be one of you know many episodes that we do on uh, on gaming because there's just like so much happening in this space. Um, so Absolutely. Maybe, maybe maybe epicenter gaming is like the next thing. <laughs> well, the next the next big thing cool. you should Thanks try to lot, do bro. is having a, having a Twitch channel with uh, with you playing uh, playing blockchain games with your non blockchain background. Just tune in and watch Sebastian <laughs> play X Infinity, play Cometh, or try to try to make a living on uh, uh, my crypto euros or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. I'm gonna start a Twitch channel. <laughs> All right, man. Thanks a lot. Thanks for coming on. Cheers.